Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Jamie Seaman to discuss the importance of metabolic health for women's health, specific issues that women face in regards to optimizing their metabolic health, how to improve public appreciation of this vital information, and much more. Dr. Seaman is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist, a ketogenic nutrition specialist, and a fellow in integrative medicine, whose passion for fitness, preventative medicine, and ketogenic therapy extends from her own life into her medical practice and beyond through education and outreach. This interview was recorded in partnership with the Charlie Foundation at Metabolic Health Summit 2022. Thanks for listening, and we hope that you enjoy. I'm Dr. Jamie Seaman, and I'm a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist, so I deliver babies and do surgery and take care of women from their teenage years all the way into their later years, but I also have a background in nutrition and integrative medicine and a board-certified ketogenic nutrition specialist. I actually came into the metabolic space on a super personal level about five to six years ago after having my three children. I myself was diagnosed with prediabetes and hypothyroidism and set out on a personal journey to fix that for myself. I do have a background in nutrition before I came into medicine, and so I had more of a baseline knowledge than a lot of my counterparts, but I thought I had to figure it out for myself before I could really start applying it to patients. And then what happened is kind of fixing myself now, I have kind of tapped into this world of other clinicians and practitioners that are using this in their everyday world. And I think that metabolic therapies are the future of medicine. I think understanding how our cells work and our mitochondria and the epigenetic changes that happen with lifestyle interventions like diet could be super powerful for so many people. Um, But about five to six years ago, I came into this space and it's been fun to watch it grow over the years. We're starting to see more applications of metabolic therapies for a variety of different conditions. And even within the women's health space, you know, something like where we would use it for something like polycystic ovarian syndrome, we're now seeing applications for menopause. We're seeing more applications of low carb therapies in pregnancy. And so it's a super exciting time um, to be in the space and to be in here early and to find other advocates within the space too. Well, women are reproductive creatures, and that's what makes us a little bit different than male counterparts, as we have a lot more variables at play when it comes to metabolic health, because then a younger woman who is going through a traditional menstrual cycle on a monthly basis, we see changes in hormones like estrogen and progesterone that actually have an impact on our metabolic health. And that's the topic that I'll be speaking on here at MHS. Um, But then as women go through menopause and we have a loss of estrogen, we see an impact on the mitochondria, an impact in these nutrient sensing pathways. So when I say women are reproductive creatures, these nutrient sensing pathways are a requisite for life. It's basically how our bodies uh, not only function, but are able to reproduce. And then when we think about the impact of, of reproduction for generations to come, that's a big deal when you're talking about epigenetic changes. And so... Women are so complex, but I'm, I'm excited to be in this space for women because it's a topic that doesn't get talked a lot about um, you know, on the internet. It doesn't get talked about at conferences, uh, but we have a large population of women that are going through these transitions and they're looking for this information. And so if we can continue to expand our knowledge in this area, it's going to help a lot of people. So when we think about the life cycle of a woman coming into puberty, coming through the fertility years, transitioning through menopause and beyond, Metabolic health can have an impact because when we think about a young girl, poor metabolic health can lead to things like obesity, inflammation, polycystic ovarian syndrome, especially if they have some sort of genetic predisposition to these types of of problems. And then when they transition into their years of fertility, one thing that's very near and dear to my heart as an obstetrician is that women understand where they're at metabolically um, before pregnancy. Because once once a woman has Uh, achieved a pregnancy, her metabolic health at that time has epigenetic influence on her baby. And we know from a lot of the the current data that it can actually increase her baby's lifetime risk of metabolic disease by more than 50%. So understanding metabolic health in the preconception period is extremely important to prevent some of those other adverse conditions that can develop in pregnancy. 
And once a woman's in pregnancy, if she develops these metabolic conditions like preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, it changes the way that we would treat her after pregnancy as well. So this is such an important time in her life um, because it can really be predictive of what her future health problems and outcomes could be. And then after pregnancy, metabolic health, if a woman comes into perimenopause and menopause with poor metabolic health, insulin resistance, high blood pressure, uh, maybe some problems with cognition, menopause can just be like the total you know, nail in the coffin for these patients because they're already fighting inflammation, they're fighting insulin resistance, and then with the loss of estrogen, the metabolic disease just ramps up even more. Yeah, I don't think that, you know, when we use the word metabolic health, I'm not sure that patients really know what that, what, what does that mean? You know, it just seems kind of like this overarching, you know, umbrella topic. Okay, metabolism, does that have something to do with my metabolism? But what metabolic health really means and the way that I describe it to patients is every single one of our cells inside of our body has these little battery packs in it. And as we age, we know naturally our cells go through something called cellular senescence. So the car doesn't drive the same, you know, uh, 20 years later like it did off the, the parking lot the first day that you bought it. And we know that that's just a natural progression. But by supporting ourselves in the best way possible with lifestyle interventions like nutrition and exercise, the way we sleep, the way that we create stress resiliency in our lives, it can help our cells function more optimally, even though aging is completely inevitable. And so the way that I've really used metabolic health in my practice is empowering the patients to know that they actually can make a difference, right? I feel like people get a diagnosis of, of XYZ and for some people, something like diabetes, for instance, seems like a death sentence. Like I'm just gonna deal with this for the rest of my life. I'm gonna have to take these medications. It's gonna mean a lot of doctor's visits. But when patients are empowered to know that they can make a difference with something as simple as nutrition, because nutrition is something we do three times a day for most people. And I think it's the one thing that can have the most powerful impact in a short amount of time. For instance, somebody with dysregulated blood sugars, uh, starting to do low carb therapy with this, this patient, we can see improvement in blood sugars within days. I mean, it's very, very, very quick, um, as opposed to you know going on a medication and saying, let's check back in three months and see where things are at. So I think even though metabolic health is kind of this umbrella term, it's really something that a patient can do to improve themselves. From a doctor perspective, we love it because it's very what we call preventative. And I think that that's the answer where we're going in healthcare is we have to start to have more personal accountability as patients. We need to start taking a more preventative approach within within our clinic with these types of therapies and interventions. And it's just going to make us a healthier society in the long run. Education is absolutely important for these patients because we live in a world where information is so readily available. We are living in a day and age where my patients can come in and they can read all the same journal articles that I can. They have access to all the same information that I have. You know, traditionally in medicine, you know, it was like we had this vault of information that was only available to practitioners. And these days, patients have the, ac the same access that we do. But there's a lot of misinformation out there as well, especially in the low carb ketogenic metabolic world. Um, and so as practitioners, we need to be the leaders in this space when it comes to education with providing material education content for patients um, that is good information, that's evidence backed. But we learn a lot from our patients too. We're, we're in kind of this new world of metabolic therapy and we are learning so much about this just from watching our patients and learning from them and having the ability to watch their labs change and to watch their symptoms disappear and to just kind of start living in a whole new level of life. And that's super exciting for me as a practitioner. What's been so amazing for me is to watch my patients' lives change uh, through metabolic therapy, for instance, I have had patients that have struggled with years of infertility. And by making these just small everyday changes, changing their diet, reducing inflammation, watching their labs improve, and then I've had patients who have been able to achieve a pregnancy. And then to care for them throughout the pregnancy and have a healthy delivery and a healthy baby. And, you know, they've reduced their lifetime risk of, of, you know, things like diabetes and, and high blood pressure, that's extremely rewarding for me uh, when I put my head on my pillow at night. When it comes to metabolic therapy and differences between men and women, 
women, especially like within the home, tend to compare themselves to their male counterparts. And when it comes to something like weight loss, like when we're treating obesity, um, we know that you know weight loss happens at a different pace. We know that, um, especially in a menstruating woman, we can see um, such an influence from the hormones that they respond differently to how they feel. And so when you're working with women, you need to know where they're at in their you know hormonal life cycle and that's gonna be the best way to support them in making some of these changes. For women, our bodies are very susceptible to stressors. And so when you talk about you know, metabolic therapies and changing a diet, and, and it, can, it can have an impact on their, their thyroid and their hormones, especially if it's a woman who's in her years of fertility and menstrual cycle. And so women are very unique. We're not like men. Uh, and I think we need to continue to recognize that because the way that metabolic therapy looks for you know, a wife and her husband who might be trying to do this together could look really different. Mm -hmm. Well, there's really five pillars that I like to talk about when it comes to our metabolic health. The first one being nutrition, because it's something we tend to do multiple times per day. And through these nutrient sensing pathways can have a big impact on our metabolic health. The second one is movement, the way that we exercise, resistance training. I'm a huge fan of always taking the stairs and just having a lot more movement in our lives. We've become a very sedentary society. And so movement is kind of that second pillar of metabolic health. The third one is sleep. I think people think that you just lay your head on your pillow and you sleep and then you wake up the next day, but sleep is actually when our body is repairing and regenerating, our cells are recovering, we have these processes like autophagy that are happening, and so sleep is a super undervalued part of our metabolic health. The next one is stress, and it can be psychological stress, mental stress, physical stress. The way that we recover from our everyday world and the things we're doing can also have an impact on metabolic health. And then the last one is what I call environment, and that's just the chemicals we interact with, the water we're drinking, all of these things have an impact too through these uh, you know, cellular uh, mechanisms and ways that our cells communicate with each other and sometimes how our environment can disrupt those processes. And so eventually you really have to focus on all five of these pillars, but it's best to just start with one. It's a process, you know, even for me over the last five to six years, my diet has kind of evolved as we figured out new information, the way that I move my body, uh, you know, how I might focus on my sleep to optimize it. And so we just have to know that it's a continuum. It's not a, a process where you've just, oh, I'm here, I've achieved metabolic health now. It's something where you have to still continue to practice these things daily. The human behavior is difficult, right? How do we get patients to do what we want them to do? Because most patients actually can come in and describe to me exactly what they're supposed to do. And so, you know, from my standpoint, it's really kind of working on the mentality of wanting to be healthy, you know, really taking ownership of your own health, knowing that you can have a huge impact, knowing, you know, empowering them that they can really do so much for themselves um, that we can't do for them as their healthcare providers, uh, knowing that Western medicine is amazing and we have interventions when we need them, but I think we really just have to start with that empowerment for people of the level of impact that they can truly have in their lives because most of them do know what some of the changes are they need to make. It's really, how do you get humans to do what they're supposed to do? That's, that's the, golden, the golden question. My dreams for the future in medicine is that our clinics won't be full of people with these preventable medical conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure and that in the healthcare world, we'll be able to focus on, you know, treating rare cancers and, tr and treating rare conditions and, uh, you know, that our healthcare system won't be burdened with chronic disease. Uh, it's going to take time. You know, it's certainly not anything that we're going to be able to solve overnight, but I think that the louder the voice gets, you know, with metabolic therapy and with preventative men medicine, um, I, th I think we can eventually get there. You know, it's really, it's, it's gonna be called precision medicine. We're gonna find out so much about how our genetics have a role in how our body responds to these lifestyle changes. And I think the future is super exciting. I think that we, I think we just need, uh, we need more data. We need dissemination of good information. And it can be anybody from a practicing clinician to just a regular person, you know, that's uh, making these changes and sharing them with other people in their lives. You know, this is kind of a grassroots movement, honestly, in, in the metabolic world. And we need everybody from the top researchers in the world to the clinicians, to the patients and their families involved. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Metabolic Link. 
If you're enjoying this podcast, please share, subscribe, follow, and leave us a comment or review on whichever platform you use to tune in. We hope you'll join us next time.